Casey Meehan, welcome to the Bookaholic Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, glad to have you here. And today we are talking about a very important issue in America today um, that seems to have just amplified itself. So let's just go ahead and dive into it. Last week, September the 22nd through the 28th was National Ban Book Week. And we are here to address the book banning and why and the how and what we can do about it today. Um, I think the PEN America came out to say that they saw um, how many thousands of instances it's tripled since last year of book banning incidences? Yeah, that's exactly right. So we have been tracking book bans in public schools um, since 2021. And, and we just recently put out our report that is a preliminary, you know, kind of a, pre a preliminary um, memo. We'll have the full report later in November, but the prelim pre preliminary memo was able to show us that um, during the 2023 to 2024 school year, so officially, you know, last school year, um, mm -hmm. over the entire year, we've recorded over 10,000 book bans, which is triple what we had recorded the prior year, the 2022 to 2023 school year. Wow, that's astounding information. So before we dive into the book bans, let's set the tone for the audience to let them know why and why PEN America has the authority to do so. So first, tell us a little bit about PEN America. Sure. So PEN America is a hundred year old nonprofit. Um, our mission is to sit at the intersection of literature and human rights and defending free expression in the United States and worldwide. Um, I am the program director for our Freedom to Read program, which is one of our um, one of several programs that PEN oversees that defends free expression in the United States. Um, so for us, the Freedom to Read program is really defending the right to read. It's defending and protecting access to diverse and inclusive literature in our public schools primarily, um, but certainly we also do some work in public library systems as well. Oh, wow. So this is very, very, very important. And your your title, your job title, you're the director of the Freedom to Read program. That's so right. what do you do day to day uh, in, in protecting our rights to read? Yeah. So our Freedom to Read program is a national advocacy campaign um, that, again, focuses on ensuring, um, you know, lit access to literature is is maintained for students across the country in our public schools and also for communities in our public libraries. Um, so our program does a few things, but, um, you know, kind of foundational to all that we do is our research. And this is what um, we just recently put out a memo in September, and then we have more work following through November. But within our research, we track every instance of a book ban in public schools. So this is an immense amount of work. It's quite comprehensive. Um, but we look to put, we look to quantify, you know, this movement, what's happening. Um, and by, you know, tracking how and where books are being banned, um, whether it's through, you know, local groups that are putting pressure on districts or state legislation uh, that's causing districts to remove books in mass, you know, we put, we were able to quantify it um, and, and follow some of the trends around what types of books are being challenged, what's the rhetoric behind the book banning movement, and then who or what are the drivers and the pressures behind um, book bans. So kind of foundational is our research work. And then um, we also have a pretty robust like communications advocacy strategy. So this is when we speak out on very specific cases of book bans or um, use, you know, national focusing weeks like National Ban Book Week to raise awareness um, about what's going on and continuously, you know, communicate why this is an issue and why we're seeing this threat to the freedom to read playing out across the country and then call folks in to, you know, respond and stand up against the um, removal of books. Wow. 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 Well, I'm so glad that you exist, <laughs> first of all. And so with that said, uh, we've seen book banning through history. I seem to remember back when I was in school, which was a uh, public elementary and middle school and high school, which was about a thousand years ago. I seem to remember we covered 
uh, book bans, you know, throughout history. Um, maybe when we were studying the, the rise of Hitler and the the mm -hmm. they were bur burning books at that time, you know. So it's it's not new the banning of books. It's not new. But why do you think all? And I won't say all of a sudden. Why do you think it's so pronounced? Why do you think the jump? Uh, and statistics last year. Why do you think it's so pronounced right now? Yeah. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. We have, and, P and PEN America being a hundred year old organization, you know, we always say, actually one time I was on a podcast and I used the term unprecedented and a historian mm -hmm. kind of checked me and was like, it's not necessarily unprecedented because we've been here before. So, yeah. you know, that's, it's, yeah. a, it's a very valid point. We kind of have these cyclical moments in the United States where, and national, and, you know, internationally, Sure. Um, where, you know, the, the, um, the call to suppress becomes stronger. Um, yes. and certainly we, we see that. And, you know, I think there's a few reasons why, uh, this current movement is, is quite escalated. Um, you know, a lot of this started quite locally, but because of, um, you know, like social media and the way in which we can all connect with each other quickly, we saw the way in which tactics that we were that were being applied in one district were then mirrored and copycatted in like not even another district nearby, like another district in a state across the country. Um, mm -hmm. So there has been this this very coordinated system of kind of this local pressures that have been put on school districts that I think have been um you know, kind of amplified by the use of social media and the, the ease of which we're able to share, you know, lists of books to get challenged, the reasons why you might approach a school and challenge a book, the excerpts that are pulled out of context that challengers can use um, to see a book banned, and, you know, the way in which kind of these tactics are shared rather quickly because of the way in which we all share information so easily now. Uh, I think that's one piece of it. And then the other piece is that we have seen uh, increasingly legislation have a role here. So there are several states that have enacted legislation um, that bend sensorial, that have um, the likely impact of seeing books banned and removed from access. Um, so that that kind of accelerated what we had seen as really a local movement to these statewide responses where districts across the state may be responding now to legislation. And that takes a little bit more time to undo you know, those effects as well. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, I, we're in an election year. That's an understatement. <laughs> so, you know, and you just kind of shed some light on um, on this subject matter about who we elect can also work within this spectrum of what we see legislatively, of course. Um, so, you know, what is PIN America doing while we're in this, you know, legis when, the, when this um, whole voting, you know, uh, uh, cycle here, whether it's local or national, we're in a big, big uh, voting era right now. And so what is PIN America doing right now before the election to yeah. maybe counteract some of this? Yeah, I mean, I think a big piece of our strategy is, um, you know, we do issue-based advocacy. So, you know, part of what we try to do is just raise awareness that this is happening. Um, you know, we need folks to know that books are being removed and we're not, you know, and that there's tons of um, misused rhetoric that's being applied that we can all begin to debunk. Um, so the more we kind of debunk this, this rhetoric that's being tossed around, the more we can um, acknowledge that this is an issue, that there are um, threats to, to students' educational learning and to their, you know, right to access information that are playing out nationally. I think that's, you know, that's a big piece of our strategy to raise um, awareness. And then, you know, to your point, I mean, I think um, we encourage everyone to register, to make sure you're, to register, make sure you're registered and then get out there and vote um, and be sure to vote up and down the ballot. Like we have, yeah. um, we certainly have a sense, you know, that school boards are, um, you know, more, probably more political than they ever have been before. Like often in the past school board members were not actually connected to a political party, but we see that how that has changed in recent years. Um, so just being aware that your school board can have real implications on, again, access to books and the type of content and, and learning um, that your student may have access to within a public school 
Same for your, you know, county library system all the way up um, to our highest offices. So just really engaging, you know, up and down the ballot in our election season this year. Yes, most definitely. Now, before I go back into the um, voting uh, information that I, that I want to continue talking about, does do representatives from PAN America, do you all lobby? Do you all lobby um, elected officials? Um, do you all come, you know, uh, make an impact locally and visit uh, libraries or school systems and speak? Uh, yeah. to the officials in those capacities? We are, um, so we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan um, organization. So we do not lobby, but we certainly do advocate on behalf of, again, the freedom to read and learn and, and the areas in which, um, you know, we have identified as mission aligned in, in defending and protecting free expression in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. So that looks like several different things. We certainly aren't are you know in touch with legislatures and have um, endorsed different bills that we have seen move through at the federal and state levels that would protect the freedom to read. Um, we have opposed legislation publicly that has been harmful and restricting you know the access to books in public schools and public libraries. Um, and then perhaps most importantly, we work with so many other organizations at different levels. Um, so we yeah. have really incredible coalitions locally that we partner with to kind of support and amplify what they're doing at the you know district and state level. And we work with you know tons of national organizations who are you know like minded in their defense of the right to read and in their defense of free expression. Um, again, in, in raising awareness and advocating for you know positive legislation that protects the freedom to read for repealing legislation that is harmful um, and leading to book bans and, you know, galvanizing, you know, local communities at the, you know, at the local district level, state level, national level to, um, you know, stand up and oppose the censorship of books. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, going back to the election cycle last night, I was a volunteer at a candidate forum. And so we had representatives, local representatives, uh, who were running for various office, whether it was our state senate, uh, or uh, state senate, or representatives, or our register of deeds. And of course, there were two uh, school board uh, representatives there, people who were running for school board. Now, school boards, as we all know, is usually it's of course a group of people, probably an odd number of representatives varying from uh, county to county, city to city. And so it was only two that showed up who were running. I don't know uh, why the others weren't present. Um, it could be their power was out because we've been affected by Hurricane Hulan, who knows? Yeah. But <laughs> anyway, two people did show up who've not been on the school board and are, and are running. And so um, the question, and I wish I would have raised this question last night myself, no one asked about book banning, but to your, uh, just like you said a little bit ago, um, that the school board has become a very robust, there's a lot of people gunning for, to say, to use a phrase, to be on the school board. Um, because a lot of people were on the school board who, a lot of them who, children were are like total adults but they're on the school board helping to pre uh, prevent you know certain books being read certain histories being told and so i think that caused another group of people to say oh we've got to be on the school board so mm -hmm. it is a very competitive uh school board which would used to be such a boring thing <laughs> is now a very very serious serious matter uh, for people running for that office. And, um, you know, definitely, you know, we need that engagement, but it came at a price of, you know, a lot of disinformation, a lot of rhetoric, and that's why we're, we're in this space. What do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, I think we have seen the way in which school boards, you know, have shifted a little bit. And I can imagine you and many of your followers have even seen kind of the 
you know, the conflict moments that have shown up mm-hmm. at school boards over the last four years, oh, um, yeah. Yeah. certainly related to books, but, you know, lots of other topics have kind of come to head um, in school boards. And yeah, school boards, like many elected leaders across the country have, you know, have, have um, you know, can be part of a process that either protects the right and freedom to read and freedom to learn and ensures that um, the learning materials in a school are diverse and representative of student body, or they can, you know, restrict and suppress and take a more narrow ideological view of what should be um, available for students. So, I mean, even, you know, what you did last night, that's incredible to, you know, show up to these kind of events and even consider running, you know, for your listeners, consider running for your own school board or just even get a sense of who is on your school board, right? Like those are right. little things that we can all do to just stay um, engaged in in what in what's happening across our public school systems. Most most definitely. Well, now let's talk about the ba- the books that have been banned, and typically, yeah. ba- books that have been banned tell other people's stories. So, people of color, uh, LGBTQ plus books. Um, What other types of books typically are banned? Yeah, I mean, I think we see those those two content areas as um, sort of overwhelmingly the target of attacks when it comes to book banning. So books that feature characters of color, um, books that talk about race and racism, as well as books that feature LGBTQ plus people or have themes of um, sexual identity and, you know, gender identity and sexual orientation. So those tend to be, you know, kind of our two biggest camps. But um, over, you know, since this movement continues to progress, we do see like the swath of literature that's getting caught up in this grow larger with the movement. So increasingly um, books that have, you know, any depiction of violence, but um, certainly violence against women. So sexual violence is a, is an area that is often targeted for removal as well. Um, mm-hmm. Books that have any sort of depictions of sex, um, or, you know, sexual experiences, those often get targeted for removal too. Um, and then books that, you know, can also talk about like sexual health and well-being or um, right. drug abuse. And, you know, sometimes when we step back and look at like, you know, the the content of all these books that are being challenged, challenge, I mean, kind of like the through line is like this things that make some people uncomfortable, I guess. I don't mm-hmm. know. So, yeah. um, but we certainly see you know, kind of like overwhelmingly and disproportionately attacks on certain types of um, content in in our school libraries. Um, And also important is, of course, is, you know, when we think about representative education, you know, books that have, you know, storylines that predominantly feature and put the, you know, the that center characters of color and LGBTQ plus people, those have been underrepresented in our public schools. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. It, it comes at a time where, you know, schools are having, um, are bringing more diverse and inclusive books into s- school library systems to only be met with this backlash to see those books removed again. Yes, most definitely. Now, when I was a little person in school, I remember my librarian, Mrs. Ashworth, may she rest in peace. She just passed yeah. away this year. And uh, she was like my grown up friend because she was always recommending these books to me. And one of the most um, my favorites that she recommended to me was Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret by Judy Bloom. Yes. And I love that book. And I was pleased to see that they made a movie about it. I did I have not seen that movie, but the book is golden. And it taught me at that time a lot about myself and I could identify in many ways with that character. Yep. So that book has consistently been on a book ban list um, because the girl is coming into her own. She's growing up, you know, she's she's uh, finding out about her body, you know, and all of these different things. And so again, consistently on the book banning list, but tell us, Casey, if you can, Give us an example of three books that people don't realize, you know, that seem perfectly okay and innocent, but they don't realize that have consistently been on the book banning list. Sure. Oh, I mean, I could pro- I could give more than three, but you know, I do yeah. think Judy Bloom is a great time. Yeah, <laughs> 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 
Judy Bloom, I think, is a great example. Um, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. And then her, um, you know, her, her a novel that came afterwards, Forever, um, which is has kind of introduces sexual experiences through the lens of um, a young woman. Um, you know, those two books. And I've heard Judy Bloom talk about it. I've seen her documentary. But, you know, she, too, can recognize, like, when and how her books suddenly are being banned again. This is... You know, I think those books also represent the books that so many generations have read, and yet we're still seeing them challenged. But we read them, we yeah. love them, we have seen ourselves in them and have learned from them. Um, and yet, you know, 20, 30 years later, they continue to be um, challenged books. So definitely yeah. those are those are two that I think are worthy of calling out. Um, you know, I love... I don't love. I mean, I love picture books and I love books for young people. And I think when we look at the picture books that are being challenged, I find that it really illuminates, you know, what's happening um, in this on a larger scale around the censorship of books. And um, this is pretty well known by now, but there's a Anne Tango Makes Three is a book about two penguins. It's a true story about penguins okay. um, that met at the New York public, the New York Zoo, um, adopted a baby penguin, and these two male penguins like raised this baby penguin. Um, mm -hmm. And that book is removed because and has been banned all over um, because of the uh, you know assumed LGBTQ plus or you know orientation of the male penguins that have adopted the baby penguins, but. It's a picture book. Again, it's a true story. It's sweet as pie. It's about family. Um, it's about, you know, just just being in community with others. It's really, and it's about penguins. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's always one that, you know, I you just, it's just shocking. Um, wow. Yeah. I miss that. I miss that totally. So, First of all, when you said picture book, I was like a picture book band. So my, so I was not thinking about picture books being banned, first oh, sure. of all. The second thing is that uh, you said it's a true story. So, um, I mean, if it, if it's obviously saying it was a true story, I mean, I can't understand why it was banned, but I have to get my hands on that picture book. It's a good one. <laughs> you do. I, have I have my stack behind me, so it's always a helpful place to reference. Wow, then, I have know, to get I my hands too, on that. There have been um, part of like the early movement around the book bands. Uh, we saw The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. Yes. Band. Um, and yes. there has been, you know, I think I feel like that's always a good one because so much of us like needed that book at that time to kind of understand and make sense of the world around us. And certainly young yeah. people did. Yes. Um, it also became a movie, you know, it, became a, yes. like it was, it's, it was a, such an accessible um storyline for so many in a way in a time that was that was quite necessary so yes. you know i think you see kind of that also play out like there are so many of these very contemporary books that are directed towards young people that have young people as the main characters that are often um you know sometimes are like memoirs from authors themselves who are telling their own stories that they feel like they needed when they were growing up um and mm -hmm. to see those books banned is always you know shocks me as well most definitely. So let's wrap it up with saying, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Pan America wants to protect the freedom to read overall, but you as a parent ultimately can work with your child on what you think is appropriate in your home to read, correct? <laughs> Correct. Even in schools, I mean, one of the things that we point to all the time is, and librarians will say this in any opportunity they get, there have always been sensible systems for parents to engage with their kids, educator and librarian to make sure that the materials that they're accessing, that they're accessing in school are appropriate, are culturally um, sensitive, like, you know, all there have been that has been, you know, in place and increasingly, you know, there have been pretty robust systems in place to help facilitate that exchange. Um, but we have stopped having conversations. Like we're not, you know, parents aren't coming to talk to their educator or librarian anymore. You know, books are being challenged at the district level and then access to that book is being removed for all students across the district. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where we have, you know, issue. And that's also where, 
you know, it becomes more than just a conversation around what is good for your kid or not. And more of like, right. well, now we've suppressed literature on a much larger scale for many yeah. families and, and students and, you know, even educators who might want that book as like a resource for them. Right. Um, right. So, yeah. But and what what can uh, what can parents or what can individuals what can cat ladies you know they they say cat ladies don't you know have anything going for themselves and they don't have kids but cat ladies often engage into things because um, they have the time to do so so what can anyone cat ladies parents anybody do to protect our freedom to read Yeah, I mean I think. Um you know, understanding what's happening in your local community is a good place to start. So is this something that's affecting your school board? Can you show up? Can you provide, you know, open comments and defensive access to books? Um, that's a great place. I think for all of us, I mean, we talked a little bit about debunking some of the rhetoric, just, you know, looking at the list of books that have been banned, reading mm -hmm. them, kind of challenging whether um, the book is what you know, it's being said it is on a much larger scale. Um, right. I think that's a great activity for all of us. And, you know, even in my own neighborhood, I like to, you know, put a book in a little free library where I can yeah. and when I can, yes. just to make sure that there's other ways that, you know, we can continue to promote access while we battle um, the removal of access to, to good books in our public schools now. Yes, yes. Wow, such a big subject. Very serious issue to think about. Casey, thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate it. Deirdre, thank you so much for having me. And thanks to the Bookaholic listeners for tuning in for this one. Yes, yes. And we'll have information about PEN America in the podcast show notes, as well as the YouTube video description. Read on, people. Read on. Thanks for joining me today. Great. Thank you.